the theme. For... Okay, recording in progress, good. The theme for the 2021 Black History Month is Black Families, Representation, Identity, and Diversity. That's one of the longest titles that they've had for their theme for Black History Month. So we break that down into four segments. And so we talk about the Black family first, then some of the representation that we've had over the years, our identity and diversity. But the purpose of this presentation today is not to malign anyone at all, or not to point blame at anyone, but rather to give some understanding of different views. I will express today the opinions are totally my views, not, a, no, not anyone else's. I do not, my views do not represent Marietta College or any particular group, race, religion, or ethnic background. Although there are a lot of universal truths in what I'm gonna to say today, and not everybody sees those truths in the same way. When we talk about family and we talk about uh, the family names, there's one thing you have to understand about the black culture. And this is what we're gonna do is talk about the black background. My background itself, because of my age and Tony did a little bit of my history about that as I started teaching at Columbus East High School in 1969 and 68. And at that time, the school was completely segregated because of gerrymandering during the time. So East High School was an all black high school with a predominantly white staff. We had at that particular time, the first African-American male to ever be a principal in Columbus, Ohio called Jack Gibbs. But my experiences throughout that time, attending HBCU, Central State University in Wilberforce, Ohio, and also working at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, will give me some insight to the changes that have happened during those years between 69 and 2021. But when we talk about the black family, my last name is Alston, A-L-S-T-O-N. And not all black people who are Alston are related to me, even if they came from North Carolina. We were brought in and incarcerated, I'll put it that way, or enslaved on the Alston tobacco plantation. And you have to understand that many of the Alstons that were gathered together at that time were from different parts of Africa. So if you were to do a DNA among the slaves that the slave owners held, many of us were not blood related, but thrown together. And on purpose, they separated some of the slaves that would come from the same tribe so that they didn't speak the same language so that they would not be able to communicate with each other and fight for their freedom or to do an insurrection against the slave owner at that particular time. But the history of that is, is that when you became a slave, they named you. And the naming of individuals goes all back to the Bible time. When you talk about people meeting uh, on the road to Damascus and changing your name from Saul to Paul and renaming you and therefore changing your attitude of who you are. So that many of the people that are named, like I said, who are named Alston are not DNA related, but are related because they were on the particular Alston plantations at that time. During the time of the 1800s, Miriam Alston, who was the wife of the slave owner, Master Alston, well, he died and he left her owning the slaves and owning the farm. But at that particular time in North Carolina, white women were not allowed to own land. So here she sat with uh, 28 slaves, a little bit of money, not able to have the land, but that she had to sell the land to men in order to move on. And she did, but she took her 28 slaves and then brought them through Ohio. And many of you know that live in Marietta area there that Ohio, uh, that part of it, where the confluence of several river rivers from West Virginia and also the Muskingum River come together was a good place and base for, for freedom because they could follow the water and follow it north all the way to Zanesville, Ohio. Well, that path that they took, they took that freedom path, came up from that area and made it all the way here to Westerville, Ohio, where I live now. 
Well, Miriam Austin bought land and then she gave the slaves partial land in order for them to become farmers in that particular area, our freedmen. If you come to Westerville now, this historical marker that you see here is on and in Westerville, Ohio, on the very land that those slaves worked at that particular time. There is a road called, West, uh, called Africa Road here in Westerville, and also a road called Freeman Road, where it's near the Westerville High School. Those roads were named that because somebody said there's so many African Americans living here, it looks like the road to Africa. And of course, that community was called the African Community. And so Africa Road and Freedman Road became named during that time in Westerville, Ohio, until she passed and then she gave them their complete freedom and emancipated. So the African community and the names, that's where my name comes from. And so when you look at people today and you talk about their history and their background, it's hard for us to follow. When they did the program on Roots and Alex Haley began to talk about the history, many African Americans got involved in this movement of Alex Haley's and tried to find their ancestry. And in doing this historical battle to try to find who your parents were or your great grandparents and where they lived, it became very difficult because not only during the Civil War did they burn many of the, uh, of the courthouses where they kept records, they didn't keep records of the births and the deaths of the slaves at that particular time. The only way you could trace those records was to look back and look at bills of sale. And most of those were in the courthouses. And since we weren't considered human beings, but considered property, most of our records were in the courthouses under records of borrowed or lent or, or property at that particular time. So it was hard to trace who you were and where you came from according to the records that they kept at that particular time. But these are the views that we have and these are some of the things that cause us and, and, and looking at the family and looking at the family structure. As I talk about our involvement, if you look back, we go way back to the beginning of our country. We've always been involved in activities. We were involved in separate African-American troops. And if you look at this, this is the respect that's rise up. This is from the uh, Civil War time when they had Civil War troops, many of our uh, people who were freed slaves enlisted into the army and the Union Army to help fight and fight for their freedom. There was a movie that was out called Glory in which it depicted the Hollywood style version of many of the people who fought during that time against the South. So when we look at this, we have to understand we were around, we were there, we were representing, we were raising the flag, we represent, we loved our country and we were fighting for ourselves, fighting for our country and fighting for our freedom. And even participated in the spread of uh, the opening up of the, of the West during that time. We had Buffalo soldiers who were riding and, and uh, helping to solve and, and settle the West as we call it. You know, the program that they did, the Long Ranger, they finally found out that the Long Ranger was actually black. It was done off of a history of a, of a black marshal who went out into the Native American lands and, and helped to catch rustlers and people that were doing uh, bad things, in those, as they called in the bad lands of that particular time. So it's great to know that we were participating in the Civil War, we're participating in the opening of the West, and of course, in every war and every aspect, we participated. These are the Harlem uh, Health Fighters who were the first in the World War, World war I in the first war that helped participate and helped to fight for our freedom. And then of course, the Tuskegee Airmen, which is from Tuskegee, Alabama, they did a movie called Red Tail on them. This was a group of men who were the aces of that flying. They were such good fight, uh, uh, people and fighters that they never lost a bomber that they were escorting during the raids that they did on Germany at that particular time. What a wonderful group, what a great, great guys. And many of these Tuskegee Airmen actually ended up living in Ohio because they were based afterwards. They would come and serve out their time at uh, Wright-Patterson <laughs> Air Force Base. And then of course, 
the Ohio, all Ohio Negro National Guard. This is a service group that we had at that particular time that uh, was, was phenomenal. We had uh, the only all segregated National Guard group in 1936 and 37. If you look at this picture here that I'm uh, displaying on here, we had uh, six or seven African-American policemen who were on the police force in Columbus, Ohio. And they led the parade down through Long Street, which had the rail cars here, the railroad tracks, and they were uh, assisting and leading the Negro Guard through the town for the parade and the other organizations that were African-American were the Elks, the Rotary Club at that particular time, some of them, it's just a great event. And of course, we can't forget the women who participated. I love this movie, The Hidden Figures, of the movie of the ladies who participated, who were so smart. They were smarter than many of the calculators and computers that they had at that particular time. And we didn't recognize them in history like they did, but the movie was excellent to go back and say, we might not have been in space or we'd have lost more people if it hadn't been for the participation and the women who actually helped to, to get us to the moon and back at that particular time. And then the uneven recognition of people who fought in the Vietnam War. When we were doing the Vietnam War, we were, and I just missed that particular war also, in that particular war, what we did, we, we had the draft and many of the African-Americans who participated in the war at that particular time were drafted uh, right out of college or drafted right out of high school with a higher number of African-Americans participating in population than any other population that we had. We lost a lot of good men. We participated hard in that war and fought. And of course, you know, uh, the riots that ensued afterwards and the, uh, the, the hate and bitterness that came with fighting an unjust war in the Vietnam War. But of all the things that have happened in our historical nature, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we have to make sure that we keep the main thing the main thing. And this is what it's about. No matter what we are in a struggle, we have to stay focused and it's so easy for us to become out of focus on what we're about. What are we trying to prove? What are we trying to do during Black History Month and during the celebration for Martin Luther King? Are we trying to supplement? Or are we trying to, to move one type of history and, and then put another in its place? No, we're trying to say to people that what we have to do is make sure that we are included in the history so people that know that we're totally representative, no matter what race, what religion, what group we come to. Thomas Jefferson wrote when he was writing the history, he said, we will always be right because we are the writers of history. Well, history is not always right as we know it. We're unpeeling that onion now and finding out that things weren't as they seemed and some acts or some of the things that were going on were over embellished on the part to make one particular group look better than the other. But that we can't do that. We can't go back and change what, we, what, what, what has happened in the past, but what we can do is shed light on the inventions, the powerful, the meaning, the dignity of everybody, and keep that positive thinking as we move forward. And the power of this positive thinking that we can bring to it and learn the lessons that we are, we can move mountains, that's what it's about. Our positive thinking will take us in the right directions so we can solve problems, giving respect for every individual that helped America grow, not just black, not just white, but every ethnic group that is here. Set our goals to achieve them so we can become a more diverse America. Teach from the very beginning of the levels in elementary school, all through K through 12, about what our country is about and who participated so people can see things about themselves that they never saw before. When I was a child, when we were watching TV, the only things that we saw were those things that said painted us as not being very good. Just think, the cowboy movies that I saw, every good guy wore a white hat, every bad guy wore a black hat. People that did things that were positive were white, people that did things that weren't so positive image were black on television. 
even to the point when we were watching Mickey Mouse and the cartoon programs, Dumbo the Flying Elephants had degrading uh, things that they did with having crows on wires that were sitting there singing, I beat unseen just about everything. I seen an elephant fly, oh my. And so what they did is they took this and made fun. And then we had, of course, Step and Fetch It. People don't know that that's not a real name. You know, when people would say, get up and go fetch something or fetch it like you would throw a stick and tell a dog to fetch it. Well, they were telling this African-American male on television, get to stepping and go fetch something and bring it back. So his name became Step and Fetch It on the programs that you watched. So this degrading type of image that we watched growing up as children took our minds and, and, and made them think that we weren't as good as anybody else because that's how we were showcased during that time. And we can't go back and change those television programs, but we can make sure that the television programs of today are more representative of good things that have happened, of the good things that we can do, and therefore give a different image, not only to the people who see us and our neighbors, but for ourselves also, so that we can be proud of who we are. All right, these pictures here that I show you, this is a picture of my dad who served as Sergeant Major in 1937 for the United States Negro uh, National Guard. He moved through those ranks and became the first African-American police officer in the ranks of captain on the next, on the, on the adjacent frame in Columbus, Ohio. And then all the way up to be, before he retired, he became the highest ranking black police officer in the nation in 1954. What an honor for him. Yes, it was an honor for him, but just think of that. The highest rank, ranking black police officer in the nation in 1954, for him, it was difficult because the racist tone of, of America, the racist things that people said and did at that particular time to try to prevent him from climbing that ladder of success was very difficult. But can we go back? Can I go back and be mad about that now? No. I have to stay focused on what we call the main thing. And the main thing now is to make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to grow, become good, to be anything that they would like to be and keep the, the promise of America that you can become anything that you wanna be if you put your mind to it. And that's what we have to continue to, good, to do. Good, just being good is an enemy of being great. Everybody has greatness in them. Everybody can achieve it. And if you can achieve it, if you can believe, if you can see yourself, and this is what Black history is about, being able to see yourself as a positive role in America today. We talk about honesty. We talk about doing things that are right. And sometimes those are just whispers in the wind. You know, everybody wants to say, yes, I'm honest and I'm true. We're going to live up to the nature of America, but... Not necessarily. There's a lot of people out there who just been that truth and then just some straight out lies. When we ask ourselves about people in this world and what they're doing, the one thing that we have to pass on to people is let's be smart about what we're doing. Because if we're smart about what we're doing and we're good and we tell the truth, it's going to last a lifetime and it's going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives in the world. What is the truth? You know, I look at stories about people like Martha Stewart. I think she's a great individual today. But, you know, I've asked, and I do this in regular lectures, I ask, what did Martha Stewart go to jail for? And then you see people go, a lot of people raise their hands, go, I know, I know, no, the insider trading. Well, that's partially true. Martha Stewart was asked before the grand jury, do you have any knowledge of any materials or anything that would cause you to withdraw some of your money that you had in stock for a certain item or something. And she said, no. So they asked her again, did you have any knowledge? And she said, no. So when she went to jail, she went to jail because she lied at that particular time. She did have knowledge. She did manipulate her stock, but she didn't go to jail for manipulating her stock. Would they have fined her for the very beginning? Yes. May they have given her some time? Maybe so. 
But the big hook that they got her for is they had the evidence sitting right in front of them when they were asking her the questions, did you ever do this? And she said, no. And so Martha, jail, and Martha Stewart ended up being in jail for being dishonest to the grand jury. Marion Jones won several gold medals in the four by four in the Olympics, her and her teammates. When they win the Olympics, they pulled her in, they asked her, said, hey, did you ever take any steroids or any muscle enhancing drugs? She said, no. Again, they asked her, she said, no. Now they put her in jail and she did some time, but not for doing muscle enhancing drugs because some of the other people that we know, the bicyclists and some of the other people did steroids also, and they never went to jail. But when they asked her before the grand jury, she lied before the grand jury. Would they have taken their medals away? Yes, they would have, because they test the winners. When you get up on the box and you get the gold medal and you're one, two, three, uh, uh, first and second place, gold, silver, and bronze, they test those. They don't test the losers because whatever you were taking didn't do you any good. So they test the winners. And when they test the winners, they're going to find out that you didn't tell the truth. So what lessons do we learn in life from a few examples that I gave you? And I could go on and give you many more examples, but you might get mad at the ones I give you. But the examples are is that, you know, if you tell the, if you tell the truth, yeah, you might still get the punishment. Yeah, but you don't get as bad as if you tell a lie. And people today in our society, you find out that they're telling not exactly the truth, but they're bending the truth in order for their gain, for greed, and it's just wrong. It is. And you will always end up on the right side of this world if you tell the truth. Are we going to make mistakes? All of us make mistakes. We all do. Nobody is perfect. But in making those mistakes, we need to own up to them. And for those of you who are college students today, I tell you this. <clears throat> you may do something wrong. You may get caught. You may do something else. But if you ask about it, tell the truth. We will respect you for telling the truth. But as many employers know and people that hire people, hey, if you say something and you don't tell the truth, we're going to let you go and we're going to be mad about you. We're going to be mad because you had us go to bat for you and you knew you weren't telling the truth in the first place. Lives of great people all remind us that we can make a difference. And our difference that we can make is showing people the right way, taking the responsibilities for every area of our life. If we goof up, that's all right, let's move on. Leave everything better than you found it. And so we have to improve upon what is going on out there in the world. And as you see today, there are many people now who are rising up to be somebody's hero, taking that step, whether it's the frontline workers at the hospitals or people and paramedics that are reviving people or people in school who are teaching kids and, and giving them inspiration and not holding them back because their prejudices are causing them to hold them back. We have to do more in this world than is expected of us, but excellent is expected. And to quote the great Martin Luther King about being smart, he said, the time is always right for us to do what is right. The time is always right for us to do what is right. And that's what we have to do to try our best every day to do what's right so we can help others. That's the lesson that we learned from Martin Luther King on it's good to be smart, but it's smarter to be good. Now, you know, we can complain in this world and there's a lot of people who are gonna complain that they don't have this, or they don't have that. Everywhere I go, somebody complains. If it's not about the weather where they live, it's about the school, the climate. Understand this. People in Florida complain about bugs and heat, but yet they want to go to Florida. People in California talk about, hey, it's wonderful out here, but the earthquakes and the fires. People complain about the snow in Minnesota, but they chose to live there. That's the part about it. You know, you choose your destiny. You choose what you want to be and where you want to go, but you just don't want to complain about it every day people complain, complain, complain. And you say, my goodness, folks, let's look on the bright side. <clears throat> Things will not always be the best that we can, but we can take the best of what we have and make it. 
And that's what happens. That's where all these great inventors, black inventors in history came from. They weren't people who sat on their rear ends and complained, woes in me, I guess I'll never make it. Well, they didn't give me this or they didn't give me that. They looked at the plights that they were in in life and say, how can I make it better? How can I make my task a little bit easier? How can I make it for somebody else that comes along? But you know, the, the thing about it is, is to sit back and complain about everything that we do and everything that, we, that comes down our way. Start with a positive affirmation every morning. I know who I am. I know that society hasn't been fair sometimes, but I can be what I want to be and let's move on. Expect good outcomes from every event that you have. Yes, is the world going to hold you back? That's the way the world is. And it's that way for every group of ethnic people that ever came to America. It's going to make it a little harder and a little difficult. Difficult, But speak positively about who you are. Say, I can overcome. Say, I will. We shall overcome. And when the, the will to, to do it, you, it gets better and you'll become better. Filter through those negative thoughts about trying to get even and rewrite your, your negative thoughts and say, hey, what can I do to help my fellow man? What can I do for others in my community? Reframe your thoughts and be positive each and every day so that you don't end up having negative aspects of life. I'm going to tell you about a story about a young songwriter. He loved this woman with all of his heart. Loved her with all. Man, he was crazy about it, but she didn't like him so much. But she broke up with him. He said, oh, man. I, I can't go on living without this lady. And so this was in Nashville, Tennessee. So he went to the bridge, pinned a note on the bar of the bridge and said, I can't go on living without you. Good night, Irene. Jumped into the water and drowned. Another songwriter, because you know that's, that's what they do in Nashville, songwriter, saw this little note and said, you know what? I can do better than this and wrote a song called Good Night, Irene. He made $750,000 in the 1950s off of this song called Good Night Irene, took something that was negative and wrote a song about it and made it a positive effect on his life and the effect of others. You don't have to go around killing yourself just because somebody doesn't like you at that particular time. Well, let me take you all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, all the way up to Detroit and Motown. <clears throat> There's a group up there <laughs> that that were the backup band for the Temptations. They were just fantastic. Well, the drummer's wife, she was beautiful. She ran away with the saxophone player. She ran away, ran away with the saxophone player and his heart was broken. So he, before he blew his brains out, he wrote this song <laughs> talking about how much he loved her. He said, oh, sunshine, blue skies, please go away. My love has found another and gone astray. With her went my sunshine, she left me with this pain. Oh, how I wish it would rain. And this became a number one song for that particular area at that particular time. So what you have to think, what can I do to make things better? What can I do to make this world positive? And you know, if you look at it and you say, this is how many country Western songs, and I like a lot of country Western songs, but this is how many of them came about. Somebody took something negative and made a positive note about it. A lady called in the Nashville, Tennessee program uh, call in the morning with a dedicate song. She said, I'd like to dedicate a song for my 40th wedding anniversary. The man said, what's, what's the name of that song? Lady? She said, I rather don't know, but it goes like this. If you really love me, you'd have married somebody else. <laughs> so we can take ne negative effects and make them positive effects. And that's what, when we start talking about what black inventors did, if you look at what they were doing, they didn't have the money. They didn't have the, in, the, 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 the backing of great universities or engineering schools or laboratories, many of them. But they said, you know what? I'm a doctor or I'm this, or I'm Benjamin Banneker, I'm Dr. Drew. I'm, I'm some of these great people. They said, I've got to find a way to save lives. I've got to find a way that we can do this a little better. So the people that in, invented, the man that invented blood transfusion actually died because he couldn't get a blood transfusion at a white hospital. 
They had to drive him. He was in an automobile accident. He was bleeding to death. He needed blood. And they had to take him to 50 miles away to the Negro hospital. And he died on the way because he couldn't get a blood transfusion, something that he invented. But these inventors, they didn't complain about life. They oh, took it and saw it and said, hey, I'm going to make the best at what I can. I'm going to do what I can to make my life and the life of others better. So what we have to do is dream, hope, anticipate, don't give up, keep moving forward. If you learn anything from black history, learn it from these people that I show in there. And you can look them up, the black inventors on the web and see who they are and see what great things that they did and how they overcame their difficulties only because they refuse to give up. All right, <clears throat> you can't get ahead, try and get even. Excuse me, I'm gonna take a little sip here. Yeah, now, this is so easy. We can point our finger, and if, I want you to see this. If I point my finger, and I'm gonna do this real large here, right there. If I point my finger at you, and I'm gonna point it at all the ones I see up there, you're gonna see that I have one finger pointing away from me and that I have three fingers actually pointing right back at me. These are accusations. When you start accusing other people for your lack of success or your lack of ability, you have to look at yourself first and say, is it me? Oh, I can say, I didn't like my aunt or my uncle. I didn't like my sister or my brother. Maybe you weren't a good sibling. You know, I can't stand my boss. Maybe you're not a good employee. You know, if you keep, keep trying to complain and say that the world is treating me unfair, then maybe you ought to look at yourself and say, how am I treating myself? What we have to do is realize that, yes, life can be difficult. Life can hand you down some difficult times. But in doing that, you have to take the responsibility and move forward by yourself. And the reason that I put Jesse Jackson's picture down there is for us all to understand that Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Malcolm X, all of them came from that same era and time. But their philosophies about how we get ahead were all different from one another. Their philosophies from Martin Luther King's peaceful movement, nonviolence, to Jesse Jackson's Rainbow Coalition, to Malcolm X by any means necessary, all of these were different philosophies of how we can get ahead but some of them weren't as effective as others. So what we have to do is if we want real change in our life, we have to find a way to do it and do it in a positive manner. Set forth meaningful goals, build a coalition around you for your movement so that the momentum of that movement keeps going. Practice rethinking situations, be positive every day about who you are and that things can be better. You can do your job so well that even the people that dislike you because of the color of your skin will come to appreciate you and say, man, he was the best that there was. And if you look at that, nobody talked about Kobe Bryant really being black when you talk about basketball. Everybody just talks about Kobe being this great basketball player, the great kind of person that he was. And everybody that I talked to, both white and black and different, just talked about how, what an astonishing individual he was. And to a lot of people, you know, that looked at him, it didn't look at him as a role model in the, in the black movement, but they looked at him as just a great individual. And they, they got on his side and appreciated him and loved him because he was the best at what he did. So take what the negative things that people say about you in life, turn them into positive. Do and think and be all that you can. <clears throat> we didn't make black history. Black history made us. Understand that. We didn't make black history. The black history made us. It's what we were thrust upon, what we did, and what we were able to accomplish during those times who made us what we are. So in order to get ahead, we say I can't go back and get even with those people back there at that particular time but we're gonna move ahead and go forward and learn the lessons that we did from black history to be able to make ourselves better and make the world a better place. We talk about winning and I'm a coach and I'm still with the National Federation of High School Sports and their Student Leadership Conference. 
I still run the largest, or did until the COVID came along, the largest student leadership conference in Ohio, which is the Ohio High School Athletic Association. And we talked about teamwork and we talked about getting along and we talked about winning. And that's what it's about, about us winning and moving ahead. But if we do that, then we have to appreciate who we are and appreciate to get along as a team. Be aware, be aware of yourself. Identify what you think negative about yourself. Analyze and evaluate your own thoughts. Practice gratitude and write notes to people about thanking them. There's a lot of people in our community who are activists, who are, who are our leaders, who are our congressmen, who are our, uh, city council, our educators. Write notes, practice every day and say thank you for what you're doing. I wanna thank you for the standard that you're setting. I wanna thank you for being who you are. <clears throat> and if we do that, we can uplift them and so they will keep fighting for every day for our goals and setting the goals, new goals for ourselves and others. Keep a diary every day of your process and writing. What happens to us so many times is people have done great things, but we have forgotten about what they've done or it's not written. I was able to find this information here about the Ohio Negro National Guard. The only written article, this is in the Museum of the Ohio Library Association, and it shows a picture of all the people who were enlisted in 1936 and 37 in the Ohio Negro Guard. So when we look at this, we say to ourselves, these were team players. They had to be team players. In order for them to go to France and fight in a war and come back with some of the highest medals, of honor that ever were stowed upon a group. This, this is great, but we have to say to myself, I'm gonna be a team leader. I'm gonna be the best that I can each and every day, giving the best that I can to myself and my teammates. Learn how to get along oh, with each other. Street. And when we do, that's how we can be successful. Try new things in your own personal life. Yeah, Write your own history. Go back and look at the history that you have in your family and say, how can I teach my own kids some of the history and the things about who they are? And somebody can. Uh, uh, Where it was, and you said you gave it to me yesterday. Actually, you do have it. Apparently, that was a lot. You do have it, actually. Can we mute? Uh, let me see if I can mute those mics of whoever's there. There we Everyone, go. Everyone, please mute your mics. Thank you. <laughs> but the thing we need to do is to go back and say, to ourselves that teamwork is how we get ahead. And as we say, there's no I in team. If you look at any movement, if you look at anything that we want to accomplish in our community or on our college, it's because every one of us have joined together to be successful. There's no I in team, but there's an I in win. And when we join together, we can win. Be a leader in helping by serving others in our community. Now, we talk about technology. Oh my goodness. This is my big button here. We get on, the, get on the cutting edge of things. You know, we have to. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. I go back to technology to when I had the first, one of the first, first cell phones. They called it a bag phone. And for you young college people listening in, a bag phone was called a bag phone because a, the, the battery that you needed in order to run that phone was big as a motorcycle battery. So you put in the bag and you carry it along on your side <clears throat> and you got to call people. That battery wouldn't last very long, but that was a bag phone. Then it came along with the phones that had the big antennas on them. And you could, you could roll those up. And of course you were hitting on the satellite, you were charging Roman fees at those particular times. And then of course the flip phones. And I, I hear they're coming back with the flip phone. I like the flip phone because the flip phone prevented you from calling people when you reached into your pocket or you sat down. And the phones that you have now, they call them rear end calls, but um, you actually activate and can recall somebody when you don't want to, when you're in an embarrassing place that you shouldn't be. But with the flip phone, you can't because it's closed and <clears throat> you can't call anybody at a time. But technology has moved so much in the direction of moving forward that technology, I call it neither good nor bad, but technology is great. 
for the equipment that we have today. We can go on the web, we can ask all the uh, uh, Lexus and any of the other things that are out there that you wanna to talk to and ask them questions if you don't know the answer to it. We can become the greatest inventors of our own time by just asking people or going on YouTube and learning things. And so if you don't know something about black history or you think it's not right, or you don't think the facts are right, I guarantee you be that historian yourself, go up online, but make sure you ask specific questions about who, where, when, and what, and you'll get some answers. Now, maybe not all the answers will be true because they're only repeating what they know for themselves, but you can gain a lot of knowledge about history, about your own folks, about where people come from <clears throat> by just going up on the web and asking questions. That technology is out there. And classes, we will never re re go back to being normal again is what people say. Classrooms will never be the same again. The technology had moved on, but we didn't embrace it. As much as 20 years ago, I had visited schools where they had gotten rid of books. We were spending uh, $4,000 on books for high school kids from nine through 12, $4,000 a year. Back then, books are very expensive. And so in Naperville, right outside Chicago, they gave every kid a laptop. They didn't have the tablets and they gave them a laptop of their own. They said, here, here it is. Laptops didn't cost them very much, not $4,000, only cost a couple hundred dollars. And now little tablets that you get, you can get a great tablet that'll put you on the web. And that's what they did. They put every kid on the web, gave them an email address that was sponsored by the school, put all the curriculum and everything they could up in the web on the technology. And now it's called the cloud. But all that information is there. And so you can move forward. Classrooms now, you don't need a classroom. You're in virtual everything. And so when you go to school, you know, you, you, you log on, your ID is there when you come on and when you go off. And even if we do go back to face to face, they're going to have the technology. And it's right, we do have the technology right now to give a kid a name tag <clears throat> that when he goes through the door of the school, it records when he goes through the door and the front. If he goes out the back or the side, it knows when he left. So we know he's already truant the minute he steps foot off the property. We can go and tell what time he's eating lunch, what classroom he's in. All we have to do is monitor that particular code that's on his tag that he has. If he gets on the bus, it registers when he gets on the bus, when he gets off the bus. All this information is there for us right at our hands. And the nice thing about it is that it gives us a better transition for a kid going through high school to going to college. We know for a fact that many of the kids who transitioned from high school to college their freshman year don't do very well because they have not learned how to be independent studiers. You know, when you were in high school, when I was in high school, if you didn't have your homework, there was a person standing over, where's your homework? Where is this? How come you're not in your class? How come you haven't read the assignment? Well, you know, what happens is when you get to college, there's nobody standing over you with a ruler saying, did you get the assignment? It's, did you pass the class? Did you, can you pass the test? If you don't, you get an F, you're out of here. And that's just the way life is. But the transition now is between a person who's had somebody looking over their shoulder and not looking over their shoulder is that those kids their freshman year didn't know when to come home from the party. So what we've done now is we're going to eliminate a lot of that stuff. The kids are going to be doing independent studying, the non-classroom movement. It's going to be better for them when they go to college that they'll be able to transition a little bit more smoothly because they've had learned how to do the independent study that's necessary. But get out on the cutting edge of things. Be that complete learner that you need to be. Learn your history. Learn who you are. Learn everything about the technology in the world and use it for good. If you can go up on Facebook or TikTok and tell everybody about what you had for lunch, and you tell somebody what your dinner was, what your sandwich, the latest tune, then you can learn anything you want to. Quit spending a lot of time with folks that really doesn't matter about your life at all and spending time learning about what your history is, who you are and how you can expand your life. The mistakes that people made in the past we can, can't correct them, but we can correct making those mistakes in the future if you understand who you are. And the nice thing about it is,
for my young people and older people too, is don't mess your life up. Pause before you post anything. Start thinking your thoughts through. Don't be careless about it. Go back and don't count on spell check spelling everything for you or redoing it. Don't say negative things about people because one day you might yourself, a young man or young lady, decide that it's time for me to run for a public office and then somebody pulls up something that you said crazy back in those days and it will hurt and it'll come back to bite you. So be careful. This technology in this new world is great for us. Be ca don't be casual and don't be careless about what you do, but use it to be your own historian about your knowledge. Learn about who you are, learn where you come from, and don't depend on anybody else teaching you about what you are. I put this picture of Jesse Owens there because in 1970, I picked up Jesse Owens at Columbus East High School. He came into town, of course, he, was, he ran for Ohio State University. And at that particular time, Jack Gibbs and some Urban League people were trying to figure out how we could best get them to name the track at Ohio State, the Jesse Owens track. But now you remember, this was in the 70s, the early 70s, and that wasn't happening. The culture wasn't ready for that at that particular time. But Jack Gibbs asked me to drive Jesse Owens to Cleveland, Ohio, where he went to high school because he was making a presentation at his high school. So me, you guy that's right here, had the opportunity to speak with Jesse Owens for an hour and a half. And of course, I went to speed limit, taking him all the way to Cleveland, Ohio, so he could speak to his school. His opening address, he said, the medal that they gave me, it tarnished. The Olympic tree that they gave me died. And Hitler refused to shake my hand. But I came away with something that they couldn't take away from me. I came away with the knowledge that nobody in this world is born superior or inferior to you. What a powerful speech. You know, they give you a little Olympic tree, like he said, it died. And the country, the leading president of the country, whoever, wherever the Olympics is held, they usually shake the hand of the winners. He shook everybody's hand on the podium except for Jesse Owens, refused to shake his hand. But Jesse Owens wasn't mad because he proved to the world and his legacy is a whole lot better than than Hitler's legacy that he left at that particular time. What an outstanding individual, what a great man. You know, and, and a lot of people don't know about his accomplishments in history and how great he was beyond being and winning four gold medals and setting four world records and one of the world records lasting for over 40 years. Now there's a history lesson for you right there. Jesse Owens, a wonderful individual. We need to continue to have people like him and, and recognize his accomplishments. <clears throat> Every day is a good day. Today is the best day of my life. During my time also, we got to meet a lot of great artists because in Columbus, Ohio, they had a hotel. The major hotel was called the Deschler Hilton downtown. And when major artists like Nat King Cole or you know, uh, other people came to town, uh, Lionel Hampton, Mahalia Jackson, great artists. They couldn't stay at the white owned hotels. So in the black community, my father was a figure in the black community. We were able to house and put up people like Nat King Cole. I have some family pictures here where Nat King Cole and his wife were sitting in our living room uh, back in those days. But Nat King Cole was one of the leaders in, in the industry at that particular time. He was one of the first people to ever have his own uh, TV show on national television, one of the first. So heads up to it and a shout out to Nat King Cole for black history, attitudes, but you had to take it you know, to say about him, he always had a smile, he had an attitude, he was always looking on the bright side of things, had a mellow voice, and we're proud of it. There are many black artists today that still come from Ohio. You know, the modern day ones, of course, are John Legend. And of course, Nancy Wilson is still living. Nancy Wilson, you know, is, is, uh, is well, yeah, she, she's around. 
uh, a great a great artist. We had people like Roshan Roland Kirk passed away. There are great people who are doing great things uh, that come in the history from Ohio. And what we have to do is remind ourselves that no matter how bad days are, look at our life and say, you know what? Today is a good day because I could be out of here. I could not be here today. So we put our feet on the ground. Yes, there's going to be some challenges. And there were great challenges for people like Nat King Cole. Yes, there are going to be some challenges. There are going to be tough times that we have to face. We're going to have to do that. The lessons that we learned from Jesse Owens, you know, if you run the same pace, he's a track runner, if you run the same pace as somebody else, but you are starting a step behind, you will forever remain behind. We have to run faster than the man that's in front. And so when you wake up in the day, you say, what do I need to do to succeed? I'll learn these lessons from the people who made great achievements. I'll work harder. I'll work better. I'll run faster. I'll do a better job. And when I do, the world can't take from me what is mine. I will be great because I learned it from the history of others who didn't give up and succeeded in life. <clears throat> it can be a sad world. And there are sad stories to tell, but you don't have to live in it. I had a chance to meet Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph would come to Dayton, Ohio and speak there quite a few times because one of the ladies that she ran track with in the Lady Bell uh, Tigers was a good friend of hers who taught school in Dayton and she'd come to visit her. Wilma Rudolph born in Clarksville, Tennessee, a little military base down there in that particular area. But here's a lady who had one, she was one out of 22 children, 21 brothers and sisters. And just like some of the people during that time, she had a rare form of uh, polio that she had to wear braces, corrective braces when she was young. She'd hobble out on the playground and ask the kids, can I play? Will you play with me? And just like kids of today or any other day, they bully people. They bully him because they're different or bully him because they're not just like them. And so she was bullied. She was called names. The kids kept kidding her. And so she sat down. She said, you know what? I'm going to try. I'm going to try. And her parents believed in her and told her, you can accomplish anything you want to if you give it a try. So she started walking and then started running to school every day over and over, back and forth until finally she could run without those braces. By the time she got to the high school, man, she was a speed demon. She played basketball. They asked her to be on the teams and she was strong. She was just a dynamic. They saw her so great that they asked her and gave her a scholarship to come to Tennessee State University, another historically black college in Tennessee at that time. So she went to Tennessee State, got on the track team, and then she was asked to participate in the Olympics. And she, here's this girl from Clarksville, Tennessee, one out of 22, born into poverty, one out of 22 children, became the first lady to ever win three gold medals in track and field. Wilma Rudolph didn't give up. Yeah, was her story sad? Yes, it was, but she didn't dwell in it. She didn't say, woes he me. She said, I'm gonna rise up and become somebody. I'm gonna build. And that's the lessons that we learn from people. Yes, we're not always given the best cards to play with, but we take the cards that we have and we move on and we create a culture for ourselves, promote our own growth, just plain feel good every day. Good, better, best, let's take it to another level. And we can dwell, we can, we can make fun or we can say things and we can live in the past if we want to, but let's take those lessons from the past and let's take them to be a powerful future for ourselves. And that's what each and every one of us have to do every day is to do that for ourselves and become successful. <clears throat> I talked about at the very beginning about East High School. Will Haygood wrote a book called Tigerland. You see the basketball players there. They won the state championship <clears throat> from an inner city school. Unbelievable. Not once, twice, three times. And so this particular school uh, just did a great job, even under difficult situations. <clears throat> Will Haygood talked about their success, about poverty and coming out of bad areas. Some of the kids didn't even have food to eat at those particular times. It, it was just rough. And of course, you know that 
Martin Luther King was assassinated. We had civil rights movement. We had the burning of cities, but East High School didn't have those disruptions. Under the leadership of Jack Gibbs, they were able to accomplish great things. Not only that, on the sports level, but on the academic level also. Winning contests on television for being uh, uh, academic achievers, but being positive about who they are and being the best that they can. If you have an opportunity, you want to read about a great school that came out at a great time, that made East High School the Tigers that they are, then we need to go back. You can find that book by Will Haygood. That's Black history for you right there, um, leading the way to be successful. We talk about our legacy in life, what we need to do. What we need to do is take what we have and run with it. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until your good becomes better and your better becomes best. Every day when I would go to visit my grandmother in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, she would talk about being the best that you can be, to reach out and do or accomplish anything that you wanted to if you put your mind to it. Just think, I'd go down there and visit her in Tuscaloosa and they had water fountains and they were warned, is not drink out of this water fountain that said white only, only drink out of the water fountain that said colored only. And now, you know, you look back at it and the same water fountains, both of them were fed by one water line. The water wasn't any different, but the signs that they put on them, that you were told to drink out of one water fountain and told not to drink out of the other one. Think of a young man <coughs> who's only five or six years old, who's told that he's inferior, to other people because of the color of their skin, how it marks you and can make you become bitter and hateful. And some people are still bitter on both sides of the coin, bitter and hateful about those times. But we have to move on. You have to understand that the way life was is not the way it is now. Yes, we've made some strides and we move forward and we move forward through the civil rights movement but we've taken some steps backwards. We moved forward from the time that they bombed four little girls who were on their knees praying in a church, but then we moved backwards when we put a knee on a man's neck. We moved forward when we have the civil rights movements that marched in the streets from Selma to Montgomery, but then we moved backwards, you know, today when we have to demonstrate about Black Lives Matter in DC. We moved forward from those times and we thought we'd never have to revisit some of the same things, but unfortunately history has repeated itself on several occasions. That's why it's necessary that we go back and we learn, all of us learn our history, learn the lessons that we learned from other people, learn the lessons about man's inhumanity to man, learn the lessons from other cultures and not just in the black history, but in the history of mankind itself and what we've done to other people. And when we do that, we could go back and say, never again, never again, never again will I let this happen to myself and others. Good, better, best. Never let it rest until my good becomes better and my better becomes best. This is the tribute to life. And as King would say, if you can't fly, then run. And if you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And that's what we need to do. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. And if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And as long as we keep moving forward, then we are going to be successful in this world. And that's the power of who we are and what we need to be. So as I come back to you on the other screen, I wanna to say to you today that history is what we make it. Be proud of who you are, be proud of your accomplishments and the things that you do. If we strive to be our best and put our best foot forward, then we're gonna be successful. Learn from each other, learn from the incidents that happen today. When I watch television and see what's going on today, it's kind of a reminder of the television of what happened yesterday. 
and the days before. So I bring you this information today and I'm gonna take just a minute here and let Tony ask me a few questions because my voice is running out here a little bit. Tony, I see you right over there. There you go, Tony. And Tony has a few questions. I saw we had a few chats that people wanted to ask me. We'll take as many questions as we have time for and see where we go from there. But I'm not going anywhere. I'll be right here. Tony, chime in. All right, one question is that somebody wanted to know how many years you've been doing this and why do you keep doing what you do? Thank you, Tony. I taught for 20 years at different institutions across the country, first starting at Columbus East High School in 69, Central State University as a counselor, Fisk University, moved up through the ranks. And then of course, like a lot of people, you look back and you say, you know what? I can move on out. And so in 1990, I decided, hey, you know what? I'm going out on my own and become a public speaker. And in 1990, I moved out and said, hey, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the best. So that is actually 30 years of speaking professionally on stage. I'm a member of the National Speakers Association uh, and uh, for, for that many years also, for 30 years, and just enjoy what I'm doing. And I've kind of moved from being that title of motivational speaker because a lot of people started crowding that field a little bit. And then I found out that I was doing programs for uh, different organizations and groups that might not have been in line with my philosophy of what I wanted to do. And I wanted to help and empower, empower young people, both on the college and high school levels. So I got involved with the Ohio High School Athletic Association and took over their student leadership conference. And then of course, the National Federation of High School Sports and became a member of their advisory board and have been on theirs. There have been many state organizations and many of the other 22 states, I think 22 or 23 other states hold leadership conferences. And I've spoken for just about every one of them across the country and have been their keynote speaker, especially like Indiana and Kentucky, have gone back Illinois every year and kick off their leadership program as a keynote speaker. So there's many uh, programs like that I do. And I got to give a shout out to the Ohio DECA camp uh, I've spoken for them for, for 25 years consecutive. I've been the only keynote speaker that they've had at the Ohio Decker camp for 25 years. So that's quite an honor for anybody. I hope they keep bringing me back once we go face to face. But it's been a exciting, motivating other people, motivating kids and, and uh, empowering others. But if anybody has a leadership program uh, that, that is there and they're truly thinking about a mindset of changing who you are, then I'd be happy to be a part of your, your community, just like I have with Marietta College and coming to visit Amanda down there. That's, again, shout out to Amanda who's had me in a few times also. Thank you for that question, Tony. I have a question, Harvey. And, uh, and uh, I met Harvey years ago at a prayer breakfast in Zanesville. And again, he just has had an impact on um, young people. And that's my question. Um, what is it, Harvey, about young people that just continues to um, the passion that you have? I mean, what is it about young people that just draws to the work that you're doing, uh, both in the leadership programs as well as in the because really you're giving like life coaching. This was life coaching session for me. So, what is it about young people that just continues to, to give you that passion to the work that you're doing? I, I think that when you're working with young people, they're their their viewpoints are are you know are just are just so are just so great and so fresh. It's uh, it's like opening up a, a new book or or going to to dinner and experiencing uh, a food that you haven't tasted. And you know you when you're around people that are that are my, my age, I, I hate to say that so so many of them are set in in their thinking in their thinking process and. And uh, you, you begin to think that way also. You begin to, to quote old stuff and you begin to, like, as the guy said, you begin to sound like your parents and you, you make references to things that people can't refer to anymore, you know? And, and so if I'm speaking to a group of young people, I have to come up new, with new references. I can't just say, well, it was just like so-and-so said, they're going like, what is, who's that, you know? Or what does that mean? <laughs> so you have to, 
have to reframe everything that you're doing and come up with some fresh stuff. And uh, some of the phrases that we use uh, don't don't have the same meaning anymore. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it, it's nice. <laughs> it's nice to know that you. Know, <laughs> and, and and I guess that's the freshness. I, I can't say it any more than that. It's just it's just really fresh. You know, you have to be careful what you say because sometimes you're, you're stepping on you're stepping on toes. You're saying, well, uh, I used to say it this way, and 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 it becomes a new phrase or a new slogan that can become racially or gender wise not not meaning the same thing. Uh, uh, being on the down low doesn't mean the same thing <laughs> as it used to be. You know, you say, oh, he's on the down low. You have to can't say that about guys anymore that's a, has a whole different meaning in this young generation you know coming out of the closet doesn't mean what it did back then or what it means now uh, so those just little unique phrases uh children have changed them around i'm quite sure that when jesse jackson started the rainbow coalition <laughs> that he didn't know that it was going to be the same rainbow coalition that it is today and so those are the di different meanings that you have so you just have to be careful about what you say and be fresh with young people. Are there others who have questions for Harvey? Is there something you'd like to ask Harvey this evening? We have him. And so if you have a question, just un unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, this is a quiet group, Harvey. I know, I know. I Amanda, I see Amanda's hand. Go Amanda. You know I'll talk, right? You know and I, I can vouch for the fact, man, Harvey, when you were saying you've been doing this 30 years, I've known you for 21. Have I really known you that long? <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. And he does change it up, folks. He's not using the same stuff that he's used for years. But uh, one of the things that you did say, Harvey, um, you can't get ahead trying to get even. And I feel like this is, is kind of a constant right now, especially with the political climate being what it is. And you have folks who are saying, well, this is not my president and you treated the previous one so badly. And then those folks were responding and saying, well, you treated Obama so badly. And it, I, I guess I have kind of two questions. When does it stop? And when do you get to a point where your, you know, your friends and your relationships, you know that you're not going to get your point across to folks and, and they're living in a place that does not match your values. Like, so do you keep trying to fight that fight and trying to educate folks and trying to bring them into an understanding of why we all do need to be more open-minded and, and have stronger conversations? Or do you just get to a point where you say, I can't for my own mental well-being and, and for my own sanity, do you have to eliminate some of those kind of relationships? What do you think with that? I'm glad that you asked that question because uh, no more than two, two days ago, I had to have one of those uh, conversations with a guy that I play golf with. And of course, since the pandemic, we haven't played golf, but he calls every now and then. And he's very, very uh, conservative Republican. And every time we would talk on the phone, it wouldn't be five minutes into the conversation that he would start lambasting the Democrats and Nancy Pelosi this and that and the other and you know and I just had to have one of those talks with him yesterday and I said you know here's the problem that I have with this and I'm not going to take one side or the other but I'm going to say this is that you are using playground mentality and as long as you use playground mentality we can't have a conversation and the playground mentality that you're using is that I've gone to the playground and there's a fight and I break it up. And then I ask, what happens? And you know the answer you're gonna get. Well, he started it because he called me a name. Well, he started it because he said something about my mama. Well, he started because he looked at me this way. And each one of the kids that you pull apart from each other, it's always somebody else's fault. It's never my fault. And this goes back as Martin Luther King tells this story about Adam and Eve, about accepting responsibility. He said that when God came down and asked Adam and Eve, why did you bite this apple? He said, Eve said, it was the serpent that made me do it. 
So it's always shifting the blame to one side or the other. But when we get away from shifting the blame and the playground mentality, that's the only time that we can move ahead. And I had to tell this individual, you come to me and you say, this particular group or this particular person that you're backing stands on this moral ground, has done these moral things. And when you isolate that individual as an individual, regardless of about what anybody else, no tit for tat about what they've done and you still can support them, then you have an argument. But if you don't, if you want to go and you want to say it's because somebody else treated this side or that side one way or the other, then you don't have an argument because all you're doing is you're trying to justify the evil that you're doing because of the evil that somebody else has done. And we have to look at ourselves and judge each person on the content of their own character and what they're doing. And so in explaining this to this individual, I said, so here's my problem here. If you support somebody who supports a racist group and you don't speak up about it, then you have offended me because you are supporting somebody that doesn't like me. And therefore I have to reevaluate our relationship because our relationship is based on whether you like people that look like me. And after explaining this to this individual, you know, through a long pause that he had, he said, wow. He said, thank you for being honest and thank you for sharing that with me. He said, I never thought of it like that. You see, he got so caught up in the fight and in the battle that he forgot the human side of it or the casualties of it. And so to your friend who is having conversations with you that are not in the direction that you want them to go to, you got to stop them and you got to say, look, this is how, you know, it's affecting me. This is how it's affecting our friendship. And let them be the judge of whether they want to continue to be your friend or not. What do you think? It's, it's difficult, right? And, you know, I have several of my students who are in my class and, and PS guys, you want some extra credit, you go be talking, <clears throat> ask your questions. But, um, you know, it just, it really, it has been a, a very tumultuous time and, and watching family and very close friends um, and watching my daughter's relationship with her friends and, and the way that people are just willing to give up these close relationships because of an, an odd legion, you know, an allegiance to a party system mm -hmm. versus understanding and recognizing these individual decisions and values that that these people represent not parties but the people right and it's been really difficult to, to watch how this has played out and especially then thinking of my students who are on here and, and other young folks it, it's not easy you know to to stand up to your friends to stand up to family sometimes to say this is not okay as we're moving our country forward and we're moving ourselves forward we have to get to a place where we can't accept racism and you know some of the wonderful work that monica's shop has been doing has allowed us to do some book discussions and conversations and one of the greatest things that i took from how to be anti-racist was this idea of not just being an ally but being there and being an accomplice right so if i really want to help people i i gotta be willing you know my mother always said don't make me don't be an accomplice and make me take that one phone call. But I got to be willing to do that one phone call to my mother because I've got to stand side by side with people to stand up for what's right. And that's been very difficult to watch um, people having to make those decisions with people that they love and, and respected. And yeah. maybe have lost some of that for. Yeah. As Martin Luther King said, non-cooperation with good is the same as cooperation with evil. And so what we see is some people that even who are in their silence and they're not saying they're for one side or the other are still not saying they're committed to good acts that we need to have. And so we have to look at that. And I know because I'm an African-American, I may seem slanted towards, uh, you know, equality and 
some of the other things that African-Americans are fighting for in the nature, but I'm also fighting for what's right. And I often tell people, if you, if you, if you take the shoe off of one foot and put it on the other and it doesn't fit, and then it's not the right thing. And what we have to do is understand is that, is that you know, changing one system of segregation for another system of segregation or, or supplementing one hate for another type of hate just because you hated me. And like you said, you, you can't get ahead trying to get even. You can't do that, you know, and, and it's not about that. I'm not gonna, not gonna be pulled so low as to hate all mankind just because one man or one woman has done something I didn't like. Harvey, I have a quick question. Um, you've seen a lot, obviously, um, you've presented on a um, multitude of people you've met over your career and your lifetime, as well as the, the issues and situation you fought for. Could you ever imagine us in 2021 uh, by presidential power issuing, um, issuing, uh, um, you know, to, to fight inequality in the United States? Have you, did, did you ever envision that? And how do you see the future from here? You know, we can, we can legislate uh, the law so people don't harm us, but we cannot legislate people to like us or love us. And so all I'm worried about is legislating that prevents uh, people abusing their power as they have in the past. If we can have equal laws, that don't incarcerate uh, massive numbers of, of, of African Americans. And that's what they did post slavery was to go back to slavery by incarcerating mass numbers of African American males, and then having them to do labor on the same plantations that they were emancipated from. And that's how the prison system actually got, got, got rolling, okay? And so today, it's no different than, uh, than that. So the laws have not been fair. If the laws are fair and executed fairly, uh, then it prevents people from doing evil and, and, and uh, mean things to us. So I'm, I'm looking at having a court system or having laws in our nation that grant us uh, the rights and that those laws are applied fairly. And that if they are, whether you like me or love me, just so as you respect me and respect who I am. And we're not going to get people to like each other. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, when there was only two, two young men, Cain and Abel, <laughs> one kill the other. So <laughs> it's crazy, you know? So we have to look at, look at history and look at life itself and look at the animal that we are. And we share this ball of dirt with other humanities, this six billion plus people on this on this ball of dirt we dwell on we got to do a better job of liking each other or none of us are going to be around that's for sure i have one more question so no one else raises a hand you i want to, I, I want jim, I want jim the, to say uh, zoom screen harvey what other young people do, do they do they reach back to you and let you know what they're doing with their life the students are going through your leadership the students that you coach i mean um, do you stay in contact with those students throughout their years? Every, yeah, I, I stay not only in contact with the kids. Uh, there are a group of kids who I call my ambassadors. Every year I pick out 30 ambassadors from Ohio. And uh, they are the kids I work with one-on-one -on -one as a group of 30 uh, and from different schools. And then those are the same kids who help run my leadership program. I take 10 of those to the national program. And then out of those 10 that have gone to the national program a couple of times, few have been selected by Elliot Hopkins of the National Federation to come back their years in college and become a college host. So this year I have uh, three going back uh, to Indianapolis and we're gonna do a face-to-face -face one day and a Zoom uh, virtual the next day, limited audience one day and then a full audience the next uh, on Zoom, but the three of the kids will be from Ohio and they will be face to face. So I do have a group of 30 kids that I work with closely uh, every year. And they're different. They're always uh, sophomores and juniors in high school. Yes, Martha. 
as you take the long view, um, are you hopeful that in a sense, um, our attitudes are um, maturing so that uh, as this, the, our older generation passes on, this younger one is, is going to kind of naturally bring um, more inclusive attitudes, uh, more uh, egalitarian goals. Yes, Martha, I think that um, I think we make two steps forward and one step back, and that's how we inch our way through the annals of time. It seems like, you know, with all the technology we could have, that we could actually go rocket ship, you know. But uh, I just tell you, I, I just think we're going to keep being an inchworm, that we move forward and then we move back. And then every big, if you notice that every big move we have, and I called this before it happened, I said, when we, when we put Obama in office, there's going to be the pendulum's going to swing back the other way just as hard. And I said, so we, I found out that, uh, uh, that when we got Obama in office, black history programs fell off across the country. Black awareness programs fell off because people said who were in charge, well, you got a black president now, you don't need a black history program. We don't have to do one. So the education, as far as that in the school and assemblies, for having black history programs became hardly any at all. And so that's what happens. So the only thing I can say that would make us all come together as a world is when the aliens come <laughs> and we'll have a common enemy. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but, <laughs> but that's just about the only thing that's gonna unite everybody on this ball of dirt is that when we have another world to fight with, Okay. Yeah, so I see what you're seeing in the push and back and forth. It, but if we can push and hold <laughs> so that the next time we go forward, we're going for a little bit further forward. Right, right. And we are. You know, we're pushing forward. Look, I mean, just look what we've done. I mean, so we push forward and you have, have the Obama area. Now you have the, women, the woman, you know, who's the first vice president. Now that wouldn't have happened if Obama hadn't been there. And so, you know, as we, as the pendulum swings, we inch, inch our way, but that's the way life is, you know, by the yard, it's hard, by the inch, it's a cinch. And so we just keep inching. Don't look for the yard, let's look for the inches, okay? Okay, Amanda students, I know she's offering, you know, this is your bonus points if you have any questions. So if you're in Amanda Haney Chicks class, this is your last chance for, for a bonus question. Hey, Harvey, Jim Wilson, um, I, I started writing notes down here and my comment would be this was a great leadership discussion. And all of the points that you made throughout the, the dialogue were really could be put into a leadership discussion. Now, I would also say that I'm the same maturity level as you are. I never like to talk about old age. I'm the same maturity level. But in a lot of the the people that you refer to our age knows about because we live with them or certainly historically know about when you're teaching or when you're giving this presentation to a younger group of people do you lose any of them because of the uh, the folks that you are using as uh, as examples because they do they know who jesse owens was do they know who some of the people were that you utilize in your leadership uh Focus here. Jim, this program was designed because of what Tony and Monica wanted to tie together. We missed, the kids were not in session for the Martin Luther King celebration. And usually Marietta has a larger uh, celebration because of the COVID, because the kids were not in session. Uh, we missed that. So we brought it and we brought it back and we were thinking too that it was right before the inauguration and right after the aftermath that if we tried to do something on Martin Luther King Day that we weren't sure of the temperature of the, of the water at that time. So we moved it to after the Martin Luther King celebration. We wanted to include 
quotes from Martin Luther King, but yet we wanted to slide in as a, as a prefix to the Black History Month. So, so everything that you saw was designed to encapsulate the thoughts of King and the thoughts of the theme of Black History Month through Black families, uh, through our identity and our participation. And so you're, you're absolutely right. This was geared towards that. When I do leadership programs for young people, none of that material is in there. All of that material about black history is not in the program. It's about relevant conversation. It's about examples of people who are modern, more modern leaders about uh, people who are making poor judgments or making the right judgments in life. And it's all in that topic, as you see behind me in there, it's called be the best. And so I talk about being the best at what you are and what you become, what you can become. So no, I don't lose the uh, younger people. Matter of fact, it's uh, pretty much on time with what they're thinking about. And some of the music that we use, some of the um, references that we use are all that young people can understand. And that's why I have a group of 30 young people advising me all the time. Super, thank you. Yes, sir. Harvey, we have a, a question on the chat room uh, from Dante. So do you think the casual racism of older generations is something to be, I'm assuming you meant dealt with, or will we ha have to wait for this to die out? You know, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. <clears throat> and I like to, to kind of tie things in when I'm asked uh, questions about socialism and, and things that people have done to tie them into historical factors that maybe a lot of people would understand. And so there, there's a story about being set free from Moses and the people that were let go and let my people go. And they always considered Martin Luther King and they talked about him as being a modern day Moses leading his people to freedom. And even Martin Luther King himself uh, in his mountaintop speech was referenced to Moses. I've been to the mountaintop. He's allowed me to see the other side. Now, that reference, if we even go deeper into the reference of what Martin Luther King was talking about, the average lifespan of an individual during that time of Moses was 40 years. And so the reference to even years and the reference to being in the desert wandering for 40 years was in the writer's ability to write that story to put in one of the facts that he was trying to say. He said when they released those people that were incarcerated or had felt the whip of the lash, they went into the desert and it wandered for 40 years. It wasn't until all those people who felt the lash of slavery had died that they were able to find freedom. So no one entered the promised land who had ever been a former slave. No one had ever entered the promised land who had felt the whip of slavery. So it has this meaning to say not only did they fight for their freedom, but the mentality of being a slave or the mentality and hatred that they had or the thinking that they had at that particular time had to be erased in order for them to find their freedom. So when you ask that, as some of the older people know, some of these older people who have been beaten or who have felt like they've been wronged or who have gone through the uh, segregation of the South, who, who've been treated badly, their thinking is going to have to go and that's going to go when they go. And this new generation is going to spring up who's never seen that, they won't know what Jim Crow was. They won't know except in books what Rosa Parks had to go through. They won't know what freedom riders are. They will never know uh, those kinds of things. And when that happens, then their minds are set free and we will free them from a psychological imprisonment and not a physical jail, but a psychological imprisonment, which is worse than the bars themselves. And so, with that powerful ending, because we can't talk about 
Um, I want to uh, show Harvey some love with a fine little reaction and putting the hands up or whatever you guys want to do, a thumbs up or claps or whatever. So he knows that uh, we have loved his presentation um, and I will figure out how to download this recording and share it with folks who couldn't be here this evening. And again, um, I just want to thank you, Harvey, for allowing us to continue our celebration of MLK and you bringing your perspective that tied all those points together. And so again, I'm thankful. And I want to thank Tony for um, recommending Harvey because he knew he would do a fantastic job. And for everyone who took the time on a Wednesday to hang out with us, I so appreciate. It. And like I said, check out more Marietta because we'll be doing more things for this month as well as for Black History Month and for Women's History Month. So again, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you. And we are being, we're all zoomed out, y'all. Thank you. Monica, I'll stay on here with you and stay on here with Tony, okay? We can wrap this up the, with us. Yes. Harvey, it's always good to see you. Take care, my friend. Hey, my friend, take care. Would it will go to sleep down there? <laughs> you may have. <laughs> All right. Monica, I think you can um, exit him. Okay, let me see if I can. Just do what we did earlier. Uh, hold on. Oh, no. Yeah, there he goes. He's out. Yeah. So, Harvey, I'm seeing your check. You want to turn off record, Monica? Yeah, turn off record. Hold on. No, I would. Let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the uh, about the program.